Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the working memory model. Okay, so by the end of this particular video you should be able to answer any kind of variation of this question. Okay, whether it's an outline question, whether it's an evaluation question, or whether it is an essay on outline and evaluate the working memory model, this video should give you enough to be able to do just that. Right, so the working memory model was first proposed by Baddeley and Hitch in 1974, and it was proposed as a way of explaining some of the research findings that couldn't quite be accounted for by the multi-store multi model. Um, some of those research findings include things like dual task studies. For those of you who don't know what dual task studies are, that is essentially uh, where you get somebody to carry out two verbal tasks, um, two visual tasks, and then one verbal and one visual. And what tends to happen is that if you carry out two verbal tasks at the same time, you don't can't do them properly. If you carry out two visual tasks at the same time, you can't do them properly. Um, but if you carry out one verbal and one visual, then everything is usually fine. And we'll come on to why that is in a little while. Um, so Baddeley and Hitch actually believe that memory isn't just one store, but is a number of different stores. Okay, and if you have a number of different stores, then technically it would explain why the dual task studies actually worked, um, because if you're using one verbal and one visual store, then it means there's no kind of interference or interruption between the two. Um, the working memory model replaced the idea of, of short-term memory as being a unitary store, unitary being just one store where everything is held, and it replaced it with this idea of there being multiple stores that all work on active processing. Okay, so the focus is very much on active processing, and also on the short-term storage of information within short-term memory. Um, we don't really look at long-term memory very much in this model. Um, for the purposes of the working memory model, long-term memory is seen more as a passive store that holds previously learnt material, um, but it's really just a, a staging area where information can be then retrieved um, by short-term memory as and when it's needed. Okay, so we'll now have a little look at the key components and actually what the model looks like as well. Okay, so there it is. You can see there are four main components, and then you've got long-term memory down the bottom. Uh, interestingly as well, you've got all of these arrows that are double-headed. So if you, if you think back to the multi-store model, very often you've just got a one-headed arrow. Um, you know, information goes from sensory memory to short-term memory, but not back. Whereas with this one, everything is very much talking to each other, and there are double-headed arrows all over the place. Okay, we're going to go on now and just dissect the individual components as well. Okay, so the central executive. Central executive is the big boss of the working memory model. Okay, the central executive monitors incoming information from the senses. Um, it controls attention, it directs information to the various slave systems, that's what they're called, the slave systems, um, the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad. Um, the central executive can also process information from any sense, so all of that information coming in from, uh, from the environment all goes through the central executive first. Um, it also directs attentions, so if you imagine um, you're doing two activities at the same time, let's say you're driving a car and you're talking. Um, so if you're driving a car, you're talking to somebody and then all of a sudden you see a cyclist, you know, cycling along the road, um, your central executive might say, right, okay, we're going to divert some attention away from the talking, away from the verbal task, and we're going to just concentrate on not hitting the cyclist. Um, so the central executive will give priority to particular activities as and when. Um, it also is all about problem solving, decision making and reasoning as well. Right, moving on. First slave system is your phonological loop. 
Okay, your phonological loop deals with auditory information. Okay, and it also preserves word order as well. It has a limited capacity. Now, this is very important. So, imagine you're watching your favorite film or you're watching your favorite episode of something on the telly, and then somebody comes in and starts talking to you, starts telling you about their day or something like that. Now, I'm sure we've all been in these situations. You know what's going to happen. You're going to be able to concentrate on one thing or the other, but inevitably, you're either going to miss a crucial part of your film or you're going to miss a crucial part of whatever that person, person is telling you. Okay, so that is a perfect example of how your phonological loop has a limited capacity. Okay, you can focus on one verbal thing, but two verbal things will take or will stretch your phonological loop to its uh, to capacity. Okay. Now, Baddeley also further subdivided the phonological loop into two more stores. So you've got the phonological store, which holds words that have been heard for one to two seconds. Um, but then you also have the articulatory process, which holds words that have been heard from the store uh, or seen, and it also silently repeats those words over and over and over again, um, like an inner voice, and it does that as long as they are needed as well. Okay, moving on to the second slave system, you have the visual spatial sketch pad. Now, the visual spatial sketch pad is all about spatial information. Okay, so it's your inner eye, essentially. If you have a little look at the top right of the slide, you see that um, net of a cube. Now, if I said to you, in your head, fold that up and make it into a cube, then chances are you would be able to do it. That would be fairly easy. Um, now, if I asked you to do that whilst at the same time imagining the outside of your house and to count up how many windows are on the outside of your house, you would probably find it fairly difficult to do. And that brings us back to the same thing as with the phonological loop, that it has a very limited capacity. Okay? So, in general though, it's visual. What do things look like? And spatial, what are the relationships between things? Okay. Um, as I said earlier, it's got a very limited capacity, um, and it's also been suggested by Logie in 1995 that it also is further subdivided into the visual cache, which is a store, essentially, and the inner scribe, which then looks at the relationship between things um, and your spatial awareness as well. Okay, so bearing in mind as well, this. Visual Spatial Sketchpad isn't just for visual information coming in, it's also for visual information that you already have stored. So if I were to ask you to imagine your house and walk through your house in your mind, that would be your Visual Spatial Sketchpad that is doing it. Um, if I asked you to kind of remember the layout of a room, let's say, um, then it would be your Visual Spatial Sketchpad doing that as well. Okay. Now you have the third slave system, and this slave system was added a little bit later by Baddeley in 2000, um, and it's the episodic buffer. Okay, so it was added because he realized the model needed more of a general store, which it didn't have in the first place. Um, so it integrates the visual and spatial and verbal information that has been processed by other stores. Um, whilst also maintaining a sense of time sequencing as well. So if you think back to your long-term memory and you think to episodic memory, which is time-stamped, that's the episodic buffer. It, the episodic buffer gives a time-stamp to specific memories before then transferring them into long-term memory. So it will take information from phonological loop, from the visual spatial sketch pad, from the central executive, from all over the place, give it some kind of time sequence before it then passes it on to long-term memory. Um, it's also a storage component for the central executive because the central executive doesn't actually have any storage um, of its own um, and it also has a limited capacity of about four chunks according to Baddeley in 2012. Um, the episodic buffer also links working memory to long-term memory and to the wider 
cognitive processes that we have as humans, such as perception, for example. Okay, so there is all of that information on the screen for you now. Okay, so that is the outline of the working memory model. We'll quickly have a look at a couple of evaluations. Um, I'll go through two with you like I usually do, and then um, if you need any more, then you know, feel free to, to find them um, you know, as and when you need to. So, first off, we'll have a look at a strength. Now, the good thing about the working memory model is that it has nice support from clinical evidence. So this is one of the most famous studies that you'll come across for the working memory model, and that is a patient called KF. So this is a case study. Um, so you've got your, your peel structure there. Um, KF had an accident. He was able to recall, recall stored information from long-term memory, but he couldn't remember things or all things from short-term memory. He was able to remember visual things, um, but he was unable to remember sounds, so acoustic information. So because of that, we can deduce um, that there are at least two components within short-term memory, one for visual and one for acoustic, which obviously um, provides support for the working memory model. Um, obviously, at this point, you can quite nicely, if you wish to, kind of extend that evaluation point a little bit and then kind of talk about the issues surrounding case studies. So you, you, you can talk about the fact that um, they're quite unique. Uh, it's very difficult to generalize information from them. So, you know, take them with a little bit of pinch of salt as well, um, you know, because it's not always as easy to make general laws from case studies. But that, nevertheless, it still provides us with a nice um, piece of supporting evidence. Okay, moving on then, you've also got support from dual task studies as well. So if you remember, we talked about these a little bit earlier. This one is a little bit of a chunkier task uh, or chunkier evaluation point. So dual task studies conducted by Baddeley and Hitch. Um, the example is essentially what a dual task study requires people to do to complete two tasks at the same time and then you know it gives you a little bit of an elaboration of what happened again a nice study to use for an evaluation point okay and then just as a final point i'm going to give you a limitation as well and that is that Research into the working memory model uses what's known as a nomothetic approach to research. Now, what that means is, is that it attempts to create general universal laws that applies to all people regarding how short-term memory processes information, and it's all based on these dual task studies conducted under lab conditions. Now, the alternative to that is that they could also use what's known as an ideographic approach, which focuses more on individual experiences rather than the creation of universal laws. Now, you've got a lot of people who use this ideographic approach. For example, you had people like um, Shallis and Warrington who looked at KF, um, or Oliver Sacks who looked at Clive Waring, uh, Brenda Milner who looked at HM, these are all memory case studies. Now, using an ideographic approach can shed light on how short-term memory loss can vary between individual people. Um, so, for example, HM was very, very severely affected in terms of his short-term memory, um, but not as badly as Clive Waring. Um, so, there is a big, big variation between people who have had uh, or who have experienced short-term memory loss, and that's something that can't necessarily be captured by taking uh, a nomothetic approach. Now, equally, taking just an ideographic approach isn't going to work either, because then you just run into the problems of using case studies all the time. However, um, if you were to use both um, approaches alongside each other, then it could actually further our understanding of how human memory works far more than if it were just the ideographic approach or the nomothetic approach. 
Okay, so that's just a that's just an, a third evaluation point that you can use there. Uh, it's a nice issues and debates one, and one that can be thrown in nicely. Um, if you haven't come across the phrases nomothetic and ideographic yet, um, it might be that you're only going to cover them in year two. It always depends on how the course is laid out um, where you are. But if this is the first time you're hearing them, then at least you've got a little bit of a head start already. Right, well that's the end of the video. I hope it's been useful and thank you for listening.